So let's say you're getting back into Nintendo 64 or maybe you're getting into the system for the first time. Maybe the Switch Online Expansion Pack has renewed your interest or given you an interest in the system. So let's say you go to gaming forums that specifically are talking about the Nintendo 64 and you ask what games are worth playing on the system. Well, chances are most of those lists are going to have the same 5 to 10 Nintendo or Rare games on it. Uh, maybe occasionally they'll throw in some third-party games, but for the most part, it's Nintendo and Rare. You're gonna get your Marios, your Zeldas, Banjo-Kazooies, your GoldenEyes, your Perfect Darks, and all that stuff. In fact, it's kind of a very boring system to collect for if you ask me. But then again, I do have most of the games I want for the system, and the depth of the library isn't super deep. But there are some really good third-party games that are worth checking out in case you have a Nintendo 64 or you're just interested in the console. So I thought I would cover five of them in this video. Now my N64 collection isn't super deep, I have about 30 to 40 games, so I'm not sure if I can make very many more of these videos, but I thought I would spotlight five that I enjoy that aren't Nintendo or Rare games on the N64. Honestly, I have a love-hate relationship with this console. It sucked owning this console back in the day because there was a severe game drought on it. I know the hardcore blind Nintendo fanboys will try and argue with me, but I had an N64 and a PS1 back in the day, and the N64 mostly collected dust because there was a huge drought in between games that were actually worth playing. But now that the Nintendo 64's entire library is out there and you're not waiting four months to a year to play something really big or really good on the system, it's actually a good system to go back and collect for. Back in the day, it sucked, there were droughts, and I know Nintendo fanboys, and I'm not specifically talking about fans, if you're a huge fan of this system and you had great memories with it, I will actually sit there and listen to your memories and your stories if you love the games. That's awesome. I'm talking about the blind Nintendo fanboys that would sit there and brag that the competitor's system was actually actively getting tons more third-party support by saying things like, it's quality, not quantity. And while yes, the PS1 definitely had a lot more crappy games on it, but it had a lot more games in general. And I noticed that they weren't saying that when the Wii was around, which actually the Wii is actually a really good console and has a great library of games. In fact, this is going to be very unpopular for me to say, but out of Nintendo's consoles, the Nintendo 64 has the weakest library, this side of the Virtual Boy. In fact, the only system that has a weaker library is the Virtual Boy. Every other system Nintendo has released has a much deeper, well-rounded library. And I know that's not a popular thing to say, but I don't care. I have a love-hate relationship with this system. Had great times with GoldenEye and so many other games, but in the end, it's kind of a weak system. And if you don't believe me, then, well, why don't you play the best 2D fighter on the si Oh, wait. Oh, okay. Why don't you play the myriad of great sh- Oh, wait, there's a shoot 'em up There's- there's one? Its library has holes. So if you're collecting for the system, just keep that in mind. But here are five lesser-known third-party games, not Nintendo releases, for the system. And again, I'm not bashing the system, but again, I've never thought it was the greatest thing ever. And I know that a lot of people back in the day just loved this system, and I had great times with it, but I also struggled with its incredible lack of third-party support. Which is why those main Nintendo and Rare games, first and second party games, are the ones that usually get mentioned first. And with no further ado, here are five non-Nintendo or Rare N64 games that are worth playing. After Rare was done with GoldenEye, EA was quick to snatch up the Bond license, leaving Rare to make Perfect Dark and for Eurocom to handle the next N64 game with the Bond name in it. The world is not enough. Tomorrow Never Dies was a PS1 exclusive, but N64 gamers really didn't miss much by not having it on their console. I've said it before, and I'll say it again. Not, man I love being a turtle, but that's awesome. But Eurocom is the best post-rare Bond developer, with handfuls of N64 gamers themselves that will tell you that they even like The World Is Not Enough better 
than GoldenEye. While I still personally prefer GoldenEye, I can't deny The World Is Not Enough is the best possible follow-up to GoldenEye that there could have been and even surpasses it in some areas. Eurocom not only faithfully reproduced the gameplay and design aspects that made GoldenEye so fun, but also made a game that feels more like a Bond game. Not only did they manage to get quite a bit of voice dialogue in this cart, which was a big deal for N64 games, but the focus is more gadget heavy in nature, meaning the game captures the spirit of Bond better than GoldenEye did. The mission designs mirror those in GoldenEye, where the devs give you a map and a variety of objectives to complete, the number of which depends on the difficulty level you're playing on, just like in GoldenEye. The mission structure, controls, and general gameplay really do recapture the feel of Rare's Goliath. The gunplay is good even if I do like GoldenEye's a little better, it just feels a little faster and more arcadey. There are even bots added to the deathmatch mode here, but they aren't nearly as good as those in Perfect Dark. That being said, this game still offers some fantastic split-screen multiplayer, which is why we really, really loved GoldenEye to begin with. If you weren't an informed gamer at the time and didn't know that Rare had lost the Bond license, you probably wouldn't have known that The World Is Not Enough was developed by a separate, new developer. Even though it stands in its predecessor's huge shadow, Eurocom really did make a Bond game that is just as good as Rare's game, and most of the best Bond games that have been made since have also been made by Eurocom. If you loved GoldenEye, but haven't given this game a chance yet, you owe it to yourself to give it a look. I did a full review on this game a while back, but this is a game that's worth covering twice or more. I'm sure I'll find a reason to cover it again sometime in the future, just so I can replay it. Global Assault is the second game in the Battle Tank series, and the game is pretty much just about blowing stuff up in a tank. There's obviously more to it than that, but the mayhem that is produced in the hectic single and multiplayer modes of play is exhilarating and really fun. The single player campaign is good and features objective based missions that usually come down to blow everything up while completing objectives like blow everything up, kill every enemy, blow everything up, rescue prisoners, blow everything up, get from point A to point B. This game is just pure fun mayhem. The multiplayer modes add extra replayability and you can play with friends or just against computer opponents. There's a good variety of modes to the multiplayer, but you can't customize either the timer or kill counts. If you're looking for some simple, fun vehicular combat, the N64 doesn't offer anything better than Battle Tanks Global Assault. Yeah, screw Vigilante 8, whatever. Video game remakes and remasters aren't new to gaming. The early 3D era was an incredibly exciting time in gaming, where we witnessed developers taking popular 2D franchises and updating them for the new 3D era. This was the most exciting time in gaming, if you ask me, because we were excited to see how developers were going to translate a 2D game into one that now had a Z axis. The design of some 2D games created such a daunting challenge to developers in trying to figure out what characteristics of the 2D product would make it into the 3D one. 
In late 1998, Midway released Gauntlet Legends in the Arcade, bringing their classic arcade series beautifully into the 3D realm, even surpassing the 2D offerings in my humble opinion. Less than a year later, on my 15th birthday in 1999, the N64 version of Gauntlet Legends was released here in North America. While it would probably be an easier job just to make a new IP in the early 3D era than potentially ruining a popular 2D franchise, Midway smashed this one out of the park, keeping all the important parts of the original but adding complex 3D level designs that were still filled with throgs of enemies, tons of secret hidden areas, and even surpassing the classic series by adding an RPG leveling system, fully turning it into a light hack and slash RPG. A diet Diablo, if you will. I have a very hard time putting this game down once I start it. Throw in up to 4 player multiplayer and you have the formula for one of the best single and multiplayer games on the system. Some have complained the game is shallow and repetitive being in an arcade port, but taken as a light RPG, that's the appeal here. Getting a hack and slash RPG without more complicated elements added. While depth is definitely welcome and has its place in games like Diablo, sometimes you just want a simple, more accessible experience that can be enjoyed with friends, and Gauntlet Legends fills that niche very nicely. Gauntlet Legends is not just one of the best multiplayer games on the system, it's one of the best games in general in the N64 library. Robotron 64, along with Robotron X on the PS1, was another attempt at updating classic 2D gameplay into 3D, and I would call it a success in the gameplay department. Robotron 64 is a semi-port of the PS1's Robotron X, and both games definitely recapture the intense, fun feel of the original tough-as-nails Robotron 2084, on top of some really intense shooter gameplay, a solid frame rate, and graphics that recapture the look of the arcade game, Robotron even allows players to dual-wield Nintendo 64 controllers to have true twin-stick movement and aiming, like the arcade game it's based on. This game is just pure fun. Is it repetitive in nature? Absolutely, but that doesn't hamper the experience, which is a simplistic, fun arcade shooter that will draw you in despite its simple concept. The controls are tight, the frame rate is solid, and the gameplay is addictive. The soundtrack is also amazing in this game. This is another one of the games that I would rank as one of the system's best. It's super addictive, and I would say a success at making the jump from the 2D era into the new world of 3D gaming, even if it flew under the radar in its time. So I only just realized that I own this game on the N64. Uh, you see, my cartridge was water damaged, and the sticker was incredibly water damaged. And I thought it was Cruising USA because I could only make out maybe like a car on the front cover, or maybe it was Cruising World. That was until I took another look at it the other day and realized, holy crap, this ain't lame Cruising USA, this is Rush 2049. 
possibly the best arcade racing game on the Nintendo 64. By my own admission, so far I'm pretty trash at this game. I'm still in the newbie phase of playing. What makes Rush 2049 and the Rush series in general so fun is the fast-paced arcade racing in tracks that have a ton of fun shortcuts to find and a ton of fun places to catch some serious hang time in your car, bro. I can't seem to get past third place in any race in this game yet, but hidden throughout the tracks are secret tokens that can be used to unlock new cars and car parts to help you get ahead in this game. Fast-paced racing, tons of shortcuts to find in each track, and rewards for fully exploring these tracks. Add in 4-player battle mode and a cool stunt mode where you can complete stunts for points, and you have the formula for the best arcade racer on the N64, and it has a ton of replay value. The N64 version might not look as good as the Dreamcast version, or the version of the game on Midway Arcade Treasures 3 on the PS2, GameCube, or Xbox. Did you know it was actually on Midway Arcade Treasures 3 on those systems? In case you're trying to get a loose copy, the Dreamcast version is way overpriced, but the N64 version is okay on price. It may not look as good, but it still plays smoothly and keeps the gameplay just as fast and fun. And as for my cartridge, if you buy physical games, always be weary after a hurricane or when the Mississippi River overflows or some other disaster like that. Because seller sites such as eBay will be flooded <clears throat> with water damaged games. Most of the carts can be dried, cleaned, and made to work again, but their plastic might be just a little stained and crusty, and their labels might be damaged as well. Just something to keep an eye out for there with these sometimes shady selling practices on these sites. 